Okay. Can you hear me? Is this working? Hi, everyone. So sorry about that. We're having problems with the projector. So we're going to old school it on Elmo until the people from Course Capture come. Um, but hi, thank you all for coming to our second class. We're so excited to see you. Uh, yeah. Uh, for anyone that just joined the class, I'm Nate. Um, this is Ava, and we'll be your instructors this semester. And then we've JJ right here is one of our TAs. So thanks, everyone, for being here. We have to use the mic because there's been audio problems with B courses when you don't use the mic. So we have to use the mic. Uh, we know you can all hear us anyways. But yeah, so today's class is more of like a history class um, going into some of the political, social uh, roots in blockchain and Bitcoin. And we're gonna take you through to see where did we start, where were we before Bitcoin, then how did Bitcoin come about, and where did Bitcoin take us, and then where are we now? Um, and so from cypherpunks to JP Morgan Chase, like how did we get there? Um, again, I'll take you through some of the um, pre-Bitcoin ideologies. Nate's gonna show you some of the scandals, hacks, illegal activity. I know some of you touched on that last time. That's something that you guys were interested in. Um, the rise of Ethereum, then we're gonna talk about when did banks start getting interested in blockchain, um, and then how does the community work and what are politics within the blockchain community itself, and where are we today? So pre-Bitcoin, you know, let me see. There were some like libertarian ideologies that were taking hold throughout the um, like beginning of Bitcoin, um, but something that I wanna really touch on that is a central tenet, uh, maybe turn my brightness down. That'll work. Because <laughs> they can't really see. Central tenet throughout like blockchain technology and this lecture in particular is privacy and the right to privacy and what privacy means. So some people define privacy as a state or condition of being free from being observed or disturbed by other people. Um, privacy is not secrecy. So just because you want privacy doesn't mean that you necessarily have something that you want to hide. And I think that's something that a lot of people um, are confused about when they got interested in blockchain technology. You know, why is it anonymous? Why is it pseudonymous? They must be trafficking drugs. They must be doing some sort of illegal activity. That's why they want it to be private. That's not the case. It's just that you don't want to be observed and that you believe that you have the right to some sort of privacy. Um, and some of why privacy is important um, is because privacy has been used. Um, the obstruction of privacy, I'm sorry, has been used as a means of oppression in the past. So we can take you through um, and I can read out all these headlines. But in 1917, during World War I, the US Department of Justice created a special subversion section devoted to spying on black Americans. In 1942, during World War II, the FBI gathered information on enemy aliens leading to the internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans. In 1956, the FBI begins uh, COINTELPRO to disrupt and discredit black civil rights groups leading to the assassination or imprisonment of key leaders. In 1961, the FBI targeted 12 leaders of the Puerto Rican independence movement for surveillance. In 1973, after years of surveying the American Indian movement, the FBI sent 200 heavily armed agents to stop the protest that wounded me. And in 1985, of the 33,120 pages of information on 600 Muslim entities in the US by FBI's Operation Vulgar, there have been no convictions. So we can see how the right to privacy is important because the obstruction of that privacy can lead to oppression. Um, and one sort of philosophical metaphor that we like to use is Michel Foucault's Panopticon. And you may have heard it, raise your hand if you've heard of the Panopticon before. Um, it's like pretty widely used as uh, an example of why privacy is important. So the Panopticon is constructed such that the prisoner is seen without ever seeing and that the guards see everything without ever being seen. So it's this U-shaped structure in which the guard is in the center, and you, as you can see, kind of the guard is hidden in that, in that middle tower, but all these prisoner cells are open. So the prisoner never sees anything, but they always feel like they're being seen. And as a result of the fact that they, they never know if they're being seen or not, they develop this sort of paranoia that becomes as effective a tool of control as actual surveillance, as if there were an actual camera in their room watching them. They become silent, docile, and alienated. And we use this metaphor because as we you know, go through our daily lives, we don't really recognize how much of our data is being observed and how little privacy we actually have. When you give your data to Facebook, for example, Google, Instagram, whatever you're doing throughout your day, um, we don't really know what they're doing with that data and how it's 
inadvertently affecting our behavior um, and you know how they're how they're dealing with it on their end. So it's sort of like a a real life example. And and the question is when do we get to the point of being at the Panopticon? Some people think that we're already there. Um, but a lot of, like we mentioned in the last lecture, a lot of the ideologies that drove Bitcoin's creation come from the cypherpunk movement and crypto anarchists. So getting into a little more detail about what they are, cypherpunks are libertarian groups concerned with privacy and advocated cryptography as an important tool. So they, be they believe that privacy is a power to selectively reveal oneself to the world, that privacy in an open society requires anonymous transaction systems. So they, they believed in the right to privacy and the right to self-governance, um, and that privacy wasn't a privilege, that it should be a right. Uh, and actual, actually, a, a computer science um, researcher at Berkeley, Eric Hughes, is the one who wrote the cypherpunk manifesto. Um, and a little excerpt from the cypherpunk manifesto uh, is, privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something that one doesn't want the whole world to know but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is a power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. So a huge um, part of the cypherpunk movement was that in a digital age, we need privacy. They'd, back in the day, like it wasn't as important for them to have privacy, but when you are, your entire life has this digital footprint, they believe that at that point, we require the need to, for privacy and that we don't have that right now. Um, and then the cypherpunk name, Cypher, comes from the idea that uh, they believe that cryptography was the, was the way to make sure that we, were, we had privacy. Um, so going back at like the early attempts at cryptocurrency way before Bitcoin, um, did you cash? <laughs> so I think you, did you add this? You changed it from Hashcash? Did you change it from Hashcash? Did you add it? Okay. Whatever. Okay, so an early attempt at cryptocurrency was DigiCash. Um, DigiCash used blind signatures as public key cryptography. So this was David Chalm's company. It allowed users to sign off on transactions without revealing anything about their true identity. Um, and it failed because it was centralized. But this, as you can see, uh, kind of has traces that Bitcoin used in terms of public keys and having to sign off on uh, transactions. And then Hashcash was Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't a cryptocurrency in the sense of like, it wasn't really a coin, but it was used to limit email spam. So coins were only minted by expending resources um, instead of being minted by a central bank. So you would solve a puzzle using a cryptographic hash function and basically like the recipient of this email would have to see like a hash cash symbol on the, on the sender's email so that the recipient could say, okay, this person expended some amount of uh, energy to send this email, so it's probably not spam. Because the idea behind spam emails is that they persevere because they can send a thousand emails at like zero. Uh, they didn't have to expend any energy to send those thousand emails. So if you even make them expend a little bit of energy, then spammers won't be able to send you emails anymore. So that was the uh, guiding principle behind Hashcash, and they were the first people to use this idea of proof of work. So there was some sort of expendable resource that had to go into that email uh, in order to receive that email. And lastly, B money. Uh, was, is directly referenced in the Bitcoin white paper. So it was uh, invented by this guy named Wei Dai uh, and introduced two protocols. So firstly, it introduced a practical way to enforce contractual agreements between anonymous actors. So you can see in Bitcoin, when you have anonymous actors, how do you make sure that they're interacting with each other without having to trust each other? B Money was the first one to introduce that idea. And it also was a protocol in which every participant maintains an individual database of how much money belongs to each user. So this idea of a distributed database, of a decentralized database, and a trustless um, consensus mechanism was first introduced by B-Money. And so Bitcoin harps a lot on B-Money. If you look at you know, the B-Money, um, all of their like, features and principles, it's a very, very, very similar to Bitcoin. But Bitcoin kind of strung all those together. Uh, and so that brings us to Satoshi Nakamoto. You guys have all heard of him. Who is he? No one knows. Uh, he's the anonymous creator of Bitcoin white paper which is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. So Satoshi Nakamoto, no one knows who he is, but he sort of saw all these early attempts at cryptocurrency and took a little bit from each and developed Bitcoin, which has obviously you know, persevered over all these other cryptocurrencies because of its ability to enforce trustless consensus. Um, and he echoes a lot of the language used by cypherpunks around the need for anonymous transaction systems, 
um, like in this electronic age, we need to trust. We need trust, otherwise our transactions can be compromised, uh, and so on and so forth. So showing you, like, th I think this is pretty cool. This is the first block mined by Bitcoin, uh, which is kind of, I guess you can reference as the first cryptocurrency, depending on your definition of cryptocurrency. Some of those other ones could be if you have a different definition. Uh, but the first block in Bitcoin was mined on January 3rd, 2009, and it actually references a story in the Times of London involving the chancellor's bailing out of banks, which, again, is like going back to Bitcoin's libertarian roots. So some people think that it was only referenced because um, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he is, wanted, wanted uh, the timestamp of saying, okay, this was on or around January 3rd, 2009, uh, by referencing that story in the Times of London. But other, other people think that he was waiting for some sort of giant headline that aligned with the beliefs that were guiding his creation of Bitcoin in order to release Bitcoin. Like maybe he had, he had finished Bitcoin in November, December, but was waiting for something like the chance of bailing out the banks to release Bitcoin so it would resonate more with people. And the first Bitcoin transaction was on January 12th, 2009 with Hal Finney. Uh, and going into, okay, so like we're learning about blockchain. Why is blockchain important? Blockchain is meant to decentralize and democratize ownership. And we like to say blockchain is a technological solution to a social problem. So it's trying to solve all these, all these social problems that you see up here. Blockchain is a technological solution to those. Um, and so when you really own something, so when, when I have my money in a bank, like Bank of America, yes, I own that, th those dollars in that account are mine, but Bank of America is holding those dollars. I don't actually hold anything when they hold it. So by democratizing ownership, we mean on a blockchain, I own everything that's to my name. That's actually my ownership, and I can say that those are mine. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> just getting more into it, the potential for blockchain systems is immense. Any system that currently relies on a third party is open to dis disintermediation using public blockchains. So the bank obviously is the biggest one, so that's a third party. When I wanna transact with you, for example, we go through this third party. Uh, and so Satoshi Nakamoto kind of pointed that out and said, why do we have to go through a third party when we can just directly interact with each other? When you are trying to buy a house, for example, you go through a third party to buy that house. Why do you have to do that? Why don't we just go directly through each other? Um, use a blockchain. Any sort of transaction in which you need to use a third party um, is open to disintermediation, like this says, through public blockchains. And then this is, I think, my favorite slide, like the entire year, because <laughs> it's about the first time Bitcoin ever gained real life value. And it was actually through buying pizza. So you may have heard this story. But on May 22nd, 2010, so over a full year after Bitcoin, the first Bitcoin block was mined, um, Laszlo Han Hanyex purchased $25 worth of pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin. And his little blurb is kind of funny. He says, I'll pay 10,000 Bitcoins for a couple of pizzas, like maybe two large ones, so I have some left over for the next day, dot, dot, dot. I like things like onions, pepper, and sausage. Um, if you're interested, please let me know and we can work it out. So this guy had 10,000, he was a gamer, so he realized that like his computer um, the, the GPU in his computer, <laughs> most expensive pizza, yeah. Um, he realized that the GPU in his computer, because he, he gamed all the time, like he could mine Bitcoin pretty, pretty well, and no, there weren't a lot of users on the network, so like he was able to get a ton. So we had 10,000, um, and he knew that Bitcoin would never have real world value unless it was actually used in the original, uh, the original reason that Bitcoin was created in the white paper was to be used as a currency, but until that point, it had never been used to purchase any goods. So this was the first time it was ever used to purchase real world goods. And so this is kind of like reference as the first time that Bitcoin ever had real world value. So 10,000 Bitcoins were $25 worth of pizza. Um, now 10,000 Bitcoin is $460 million. Uh, fun fact, last semester when I used to give this lecture, it was $100 million. Before that, when Sunny gave this lecture, it was $9 million. And the semester before, when Andrew gave this lecture, it was $6 million. So you can kind of, <laughs> we've kind of been tracking the progression of Bitcoin uh, through this decal. And so just to go over the two main reasons why this is important, which I kind of mentioned before, um, before this purchase, the idea that Bitcoin could be used to purchase real world goods was ridiculous. For most people, it was just kind of something fun that they would do as a hobby, like, oh, I'm mining Bitcoin. Like kind of, if you, if you have an app on your phone, um, I don't know what apps, like where you just like buy coins on the, on the app to play a game, it was kind of like that. It didn't have any real world value. Um, but this was the very first time Bitcoin transaction traded magic, worthless internet money for a tangible item of value, and so therefore Bitcoin had value. 
And um, secondly, he, a lot of people think that he was giving up, um, that he didn't think he was giving up like $450 million for some pizza. He knew that. He just knew that for, in order for people to start seeing Bitcoin as a store of wealth, he would have to you know, kind of transact some of his own money in order to get people to start seeing it as a store of real world value. Any questions about that? Sorry about like the Elmo. Did they come? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so he posted it on like an anonymous forum and just asked if anyone was willing to, to he literally says, and then bought the pizza for him. He says, I like, sorry? No, I think he, g he gave it to someone and then that person bought the pizza for him. So like someone, someone just like used money out of their wallet, and then. Yes. Yes. Well, he bought pizza to it, from the from the perspective of what was his name? Oh, it's working. Um, from the perspective of Laszlo Hanyex, he bought pizza for twenty five dollars. So I guess I guess you can say like that that intermediate person was the real person to give Bitcoin value because he, he accepted $10,000 and spent 25 of his own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, any other questions? Yes. So the way that Bitcoin came about is through a white paper, which is basically just like a like an elaborate essay explaining some sort of complicated topic, um, and it was published anonymously under the under the surname uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, but that person doesn't exist, and so no one knows. I think I think part of part of like the ideals that probably encouraged whoever whoever he or she was to invent Bitcoin. Um, a white paper is kind of like, I mean, JJ might have a better explanation than I do. When someone comes up with a new cryptocurrency or project, they'll produce like a little 10 page document that outlines things like the token economics, the general principles that like differentiate their coin from other stuff. So a white paper is not super in depth, but it's just like a 10 page document explaining what their project is pretty much. And white papers can be used for other things other than cryptocurrency, but it's basically just like an explanation of all the mechanics and how it works. I don't know if people here are familiar with what an ICO is, but an ICO is an initial coin offering. So a lot of these blockchain companies will get their funding by selling a token through an ICO before they even develop the technology. So they'll release their white paper, they'll use the white paper to sell their ICO, and then once they get funded through the ICO, they'll hire out the development team and build the product. Like to a greater degree than just a token. And this is, this is also how a lot of like crypto scams, I don't know, um, in 2018, there was a lot of crypto scams that went on. People would just um, write a white paper for a uh, technology that was never going to be built. They would have an ICO, take people's money to build the technology, and then embezzle it and not hire a real development team. Uh, Substratum, if you guys have ever heard of Substratum, that's one example. Thank you, JJ. Um, no, so th when, when the coin comes about, the network has to be there. Yeah, thank you. So um, you, you can build coins, like so Bitcoin and Ethereum are coins that are built on their own blockchains. But as we'll talk about later in the course, Ethereum, Ethereum is blockchain infrastructure. So on top of Ethereum, you can just create a cryptocurrency without having to create your own blockchain. So that's what these ICOs were. Cryptocurrencies created on Ethereum without having to make your own blockchain. It's actually, it's like a temp, there's a template and you can just copy a few thousand lines of code and make a few modifications to start a new coin. Yeah, you can find them on GitHub. You can literally find the, uh, you can literally find the template to create your own uh, IRC20 or IRC720 token. Right now on GitHub, you can see the, uh, the Solidity code that creates it and you could 
hypothetically create your own coin within a day or two. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Nate. We're gonna go into the next section now that it's working. Okay, um, sweet. Well, this looks a little bit better than earlier. Okay, so next up, we will get into a little bit about the early Bitcoin scandals, hacks, and some of the legal activities. So probably a lot of what you might heard about involving crypto in, in general, as it is pretty secretive. And th there's a lot of flexibility for being able to do things that like and flying under the radar. So let's get right into it. So at the start of like Bitcoin adoption, we used to see that uh, Bitcoin wasn't always super secure. And the reason for this was that people tried to build things above like the underlying layers of Bitcoin consensus mechanisms. And so what that pretty much means is people would try to take Bitcoin and create like, a centralized exchange. So create a, a centralized element to an already and um, to a fundamentally decentralized system. And so what we saw here, and the example of this is called Mt. Gox, which was an exchange, which was the biggest Bitcoin exchange in 2010. But what we saw is that over time, there's a problem pretty much with the underlying layer that connected the exchange with the actual Bitcoin abstraction or the, the Bitcoin kind of manipulation and like trading. And what this means is that people were able to like siphon off funds and like without and like fly under the radar and take a ton of Bitcoin over several years. And so it took actually four, it took four years for the people at Mt. Gox to realize that they've actually lost 744 thousand Bitcoin over this time. And right now, as you could probably guess, that's a lot of money. And it forced them to go bankrupt. And so what we've seen is that in the beginning, people didn't really understand how important it is to keep like decentralized and decentralized components separate because, and, and I guess now with Coinbase and other kind of more custodial accounts, which we'll get into more DeFi later today, we see, um, we see that the initial motivations for Bitcoin management and exchange weren't quite aligned with what they are today. And as, we, as someone brought up last class, um, there's a whole idea of Bitcoin drug scandals. And so in 2011, uh, the Silk Road opened as pretty much the eBay of drugs all through crypto and through Bitcoin. And so what we saw is that drugs and pretty much illegal markets were synonymous or kind of so, uh, seen as synonymous with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And so... In, of course, in 2013, though, the FBI shut down the Silk Road and actually collected 3.5 million in Bitcoin. But at the same, the other side of things, um, we saw that Ross Ulbright, he was given a life sentence for his work as like kind of manipulating and being like the mastermind behind the Silk Road. But at the same time, he like see, so he's serving a life sentence. But there's this whole movement of like free Ross because he's seen as a hero as by people who want who really value like by like cypherpunks and people who really value this privacy and privacy with transactions. So it kind of goes both ways in terms of like if you're seen as a hero or a criminal. And then around this time, I mean, we see that looking in like 2013, we started to see like a gradual rise in Bitcoin. And so this, is, this might be when some of you started actually reading about Bitcoin, hearing about it in the news, and it started to um, pop on people's radars at this point. So 2013, we saw this gradual increase, and what, what came with that was a rise in headlines and just overall commotion and, and buzz. And so in 2014, after like the big Mt. Gox um, losses of Bitcoin, we saw that people started to read up and actually start to accept Bitcoin because it's something that like kind of that's something that um, was a lot more versatile than people thought it was before. Whereas before, like Ava mentioned, it was seen as just like internet money and some of this magical internet phenomenon that didn't really have a home or necessarily a value. But now we see through acceptance and overall through different examples of industries, companies that want to, or that start to accept it, we see that it gains value in itself. And so with time, there's a whole rise of Bitcoin startups that come and start to work within the space. And these are some of actually the really first companies that were interested in I kind of saw the like the really mysterious blockchain field, the Bitcoin field, and started to capitalize on the new value that, that we know today within Bitcoin. And so you might have heard of some of these, but we have a mix of some, some like some VCs, just custodial accounts, different, th um, these are all some of these companies that allow with trading, spot trading, lending, and just overall transactions of Bitcoin. 
And then with every rise, we see a bust as well. And so with over time, as you've all seen, everyone knows that Bitcoin is really volatile and it is probably one of the most volatile currencies out there. And this is because so much of it relies on news and other components such as, I mean, like look, we probably see if, I, mean, I, I think I talked about this last class, but if Elon Musk posts something about Dogecoin, the value of it will triple or it'll increase tenfold. And so right now we see that because this isn't necessarily regulated in a way by the government or it isn't, there aren't really necessarily parameters for how this, how Bitcoin could be accepted or even interacted with, there's so much flexibility and we see so much change in the value of Bitcoin. Like we said pretty recently, uh, this was in 2020, we saw another huge rise in Bitcoin and as you can see like even right here, within months you see the price changing by like tens of thousands of dollars, which is incredible. Okay, well um, I know I kind of sped through that, but does anyone have any questions about anything there? Yeah. So since its creation until like from until now, how can someone get Bitcoin? So before before trades and before people actually owned Bitcoin, a lot of it came from participating in the network and being a miner. And so the way you, so you would mine, and then that was how you could gain your base level. Um, has anyone been to Punjabi Daba on Durant? They have a Bitcoin kiosk in Punjabi Daba, so you can buy Bitcoin there if you want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. I'm, I'm glad that went somewhere. I wasn't really sure that was going. Um, <laughs> sweet. Um, any other questions from this section? You've gone to a Bitcoin kiosk? From a kiosk? Yeah. 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 No way. And, and they give you sometimes a piece of paper that has like your private and public key on it. Definitely. That's super cool. I didn't know that. No. And like even now, if you've heard of Coinstar, it's like you dump all your coins in, they give you cash. You can also cash that in for Bitcoin. So it's all pretty accessible nowadays. Okay. Yeah. That what was that? Super what? Oh, the Silk Road, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So remember that th th all these different interactions on all these transactions have a different like serial code or pretty much the like, public key associated with them. So they were able to track over time these public keys and start to trace them back to different locations and like you can kind of cross reference it with server consumption and find like different places that are using, like in the same way like if you want to track the computer, I mean I won't get into this too much, but pretty much you can look for like high energy consumption as a way of either like a lot of, to, like, to identify a miner or to identify homes of transactions. So that's more of a, there's a probably a lot more that I don't know about how the FBI did this, but that was that was probably my best guess for what they did. Yeah. Um, accessibility. I mean, you can walk over and do it pretty easily. Um, I'm actually not sure. Do you have any? Let's see if JJ has any thoughts on that. Another thing to uh, mention is like if you buy it on an exchange. You don't always um, have custody over it. Like if you buy Bitcoin on Coinbase, like there's no account where that Bitcoin is being held, right? It's being held by Coinbase on your behalf. So, or like if you buy it on Robinhood, it's also being held by Robinhood on your behalf. So that's one advantage. Yeah, last question then we'll move on. How do the fees vary? Yeah, so now kind of this whole market for crypto exchange is so competitive nowadays. Before the fees used to be really high and if you wanted to go to an ATM and actually cash out, that would actually be more expensive because you'd have to go necessarily, sometimes you'd go through a bank who would also have to go through and have their own connection with ca cashing out Bitcoin. And so a lot of times what we see now is Coinbase or like these other maybe cust these custodial accounts, meaning like they hold your crypto for you, they have figured out ways to lower those fees as much as possible and still get some return.
from their investment. Yeah. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to the next section and dive into Ethereum. So, pretty much let's just get into the difference between, um, between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So for starters, Bitcoin is coin-centric, and what that means is there's a token, and it's more, it's more used as a something that holds value and is used as an alternative to the dollar or the euro or some other existing currency. On the other hand, Ethereum is more than just a token, but instead it's like a turn compete protocol that uses this coin, Ether, as fuel. And what this fuel does is it allows for app building and like, a lot of different functionality with, uh, on um, the platform. And so what we see here is Ethereum and like the token involved isn't necessarily, you can't really, you don't really wanna cash that out. Instead, it's used as a way to regulate the um, amount of action that's being taken on network and to build apps and to, and like we'll get a lot more into, into decentralized apps later. But it's more of like a, it's thought of, think of it more as fuel. So a few things about the Ethereum timeline. So at, a, at the end of 2013, we saw the Ethereum white paper, which pretty much just outlined everything that Ethereum had in mind and what it would do and why, it, why it's even important and why people should care. And that's pretty much what white papers do, is they explain their technology and they explain the functionality of it. And then in 2014, we saw a crowd sale for Ethereum. What that means is they offered up their Ethereum tokens in exchange for Bitcoin just as a way to fund a lot of their programs and start to get themselves off the ground. And with time, within the next few years, we saw the Ethereum blockchain launch and the value of Ethereum tokens, so these like fuel tokens, worth more than a one billion combined. And so now I think the overall value of, of all the Ethereum tokens is around $33 billion. It might be a lot more than that now, but it's definitely gotten up there and there's a lot of value within Ethereum. And then we saw like, different rises in hacks, but we'll, we can get into those later. And with any big company, we see a lot of buzz around it, a lot of excitement. And so I'm curious, has anyone seen, does anyone like check Twitter, like, pop me like social media, and they see tweets about these things? Or they, like, where do you, like, kind of popcorn out, where do you hear about Ethereum or blockchain or Bitcoin? Twitter, who else? Reddit, just these kind of big forums, yeah. Wall Street Journal, yeah. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. <laughs> Exactly. So we see like it gains a lot of traction just through social media. And that's what we've seen so far with, that's what we saw pretty immediately right at the beginning of Ethereum. Because it's kind of posed as an alternative to Bitcoin, but also, but it has a lot more functionality. And it's not just like the gold standard of, of like a currency or token, but instead you can do so much more with it. So it's a lot more versatile. And so some, these are three pretty big Ethereum projects that are good to know. Uh, the first is CryptoKitties, and this was like the first NFT. Um, and what this was is people would, there, there were little animations of little kittens and they would sell for money. Just like we see NFT trades and sales going on now, this was the first NFT. And the reason why it was so revolutionary is because it provided value and scarcity to a digitally born object. And what, what that means is ultimately, if I have a Word document, I can copy and paste it and I can e email it to 100 people. And there's no value because there's nothing restricting the supply of it. But with blockchain and with Ethereum, the rise of CryptoKitties and with NFTs as a whole provides like uniqueness to each individual object. Next up we have DAI, which is pretty much like a cohort of, it stands for like, it's like, if they're looking for like autonomous operation, so being able to work with one another and not having to rely on central authority to do like trading and interactions. And then Brave, which, Ava's favorite. <laughs> oh, you want me to take this one? Um, Brave is basically a web browser, kind of like Google Chrome. It has like the same exact UI, um, but it's based on the blockchain, and it also has tokens, so there's something called the Brave Attention Token, um, where it's trying to reward users for viewing ads, but I don't really think that's, they've really taken that off the ground yet, but it's pretty cool, you can look into it. They don't track any of your data, so it's a cool alternative, but you do have to re, all your passwords you have to type in every time, because it's not storing any of your passwords, um, so that's one. Colin. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention that DAI is actually very interesting because I don't know if anyone here is familiar with uh, USDT, it's called Tether, and that was the first so-called so stablecoin, which is like pegged to the US dollar. But DAI is very interesting because uh, USDT, Tether, is like mostly a scam. They don't, they just like t tell you that it's worth a dollar. But there's no reasoning behind why it's worth a dollar. But DAI is a decentralized stablecoin, so the token economics 
and the code behind it enforced the fact that it's always worth a dollar, which is really interesting. And we will we'll get into it later this semester. Sweet. Does anyone have any questions about anything there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Y yeah. No, they they did. Yeah. So they they were I think audited by New York State, um, but they found some funds, but not all funds. So it's a little. They refuse to let the big audit. Yeah. It's just it's just the fact. Sorry, I think it's just the fact that they refuse to let like the established audit firms like Deloitte and stuff come in and audit them that I find this is a little bit more opinion than anything, but I just find it sus that they or suspect that they won't allow um, <laughs> auditors to go like like they won't allow Deloitte when. Like the established auditors have offered to do it. They're, they're up for it, but uh, USDT isn't, so. Uh, yes, we'll start, we'll start right here and then work our way back. Yeah. Go for it, yeah. <laughs> so pretty much the incentives come from, in terms of, what, do you wanna go in the brave? Okay, but um, pretty much in Brave, so when you look something up in Brave, it's th the big difference for it is it's not necessarily like there's like a value involved with it, but instead it's a bunch of people who are willing to host and store information and access it in a different way. So let's say right now in, like in, let's just work with Google Chrome right now. Um, this, this is like the big, I broke that piece of chalk. Um, so this is like the big, this is the central database here. And like this is like the Google Chrome, um, but instead we have all these different servers that are kind of um, talking to one another. So imagine these are all like different computers. And instead, like all the information that you need is all in this one, can all be accessed by this one Google Chrome server. But instead what we see with Brave is that it, call, it kind of pulls information and different storage from a bunch of different, and like correct me if I messed up any of this, but, I'm, but it pulls information from a bunch of different devices that all agree to help store information on and like contribute to the server. Um, I'm not fully sure how the incentives work, but yeah, I'm not fully sure how the incentives work, but I'm guessing there probably are some, like there are some token rewards. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, so Brave itself is like a privacy browser, but the advertising aspect of Brave is what's based on the blockchain. So you will get faster speeds regardless because it's blocking like every ad that you would get on Google Chrome otherwise. So Brave is always gonna be faster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well thank you. We might have to update that then for our next semester. Uh, let's do uh, two more questions. Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of currencies, like for example, Bitcoin is intended to be used as a real currency, but you can't get paid in Bitcoin, for example, because your income is gonna change month to month, day to day, hour to hour, because Bitcoin is so volatile as is Ethereum, as is a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies today. So the purpose of stable coins is to be able to get all the benefits of being on a blockchain 
and all the benefits of a cryptocurrency, but being pegged to a, a constant value so that you can actually use it to transact in the real world. You could actually be paid uh, in cryptocurrency. For example, like I was paid this past summer in a stable coin because they could pay me in a stable coin because it was pegged. Uh, Terra, you've heard of it. So yeah. Um, no comment. Yes. <laughs> It's the exact, it works exactly the same as like any other cryptocurrency would work. And it's all public, it's all open source, so you can look at the code for the stable coin. The only difference is like, for example, DAI, um, I think works, it's different than the way Terra works. Um, so I'm not gonna speak to the way DAI works, but the way Terra works, it's, a d it's an algorithmic stable coin. So there's a ton of like supply and demand factors and it's all hard coded um, yeah. into how it works. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's do one more question. Yeah. Yeah, so pretty much imagine that like the network tokens a lot of times are used to regulate and make sure that like pretty much if you, there are a lot of, there's a lot of computation that you can do based off Ethereum, and the problem with that is if people want to go and like really slow down the network or compromise it, they can run infinite loops and just do run a lot of computation that s slows it down for everyone else. And this is like, it can pretty much flood the network or flood a blockchain with like too much information all coming in that nothing can really be done. And so that's like what hash, what was it called? Like what? Yeah. Yeah, hash coin. And so like that's the idea of gas, and that's why like these tokens sometimes are called gas tokens is because they can, like gas tokens regulate this and make sure that there isn't too much, there aren't too many requests going on at once. And so pretty much these tokens allow you to run decentralized apps, run things on new blockchains, and we'll, we'll talk about that a lot more later. So hold on to that for now. Um, okay, let's move on. Awesome, thank you, Nate. So now we're gonna get into enterprise blockchain. Enterprise meaning like businesses that use blockchain uh, and going into more interest from banks, which JJ will take over the beginning of. So recently, a lot more banks and Fortune 500 companies have become interested in blockchain. When it first started, it was much more of a cypherpunk thing and kind of on the edge of the society, but it's taken much more of a mainstream position. Um, there's this thing called private blockchains, which, or permission ledgers, and they're not like traditional blockchains where they're open and decentralized. They're controlled by one central entity, and there's no economic incentives or any sort of oversight. So in, in theory, they're not completely like blockchains. They don't really um, embody the spirit of a blockchain. They don't embody the decentralization or any of that, but they do allow Fortune 500 companies and these big companies to use blockchains internally and in a way that they feel comfortable with because they're gonna have control over it and they wouldn't feel comfortable otherwise. Here are just a few companies that have been working on blockchain initiatives. Um, something I wanted to mention is like here at Blockchain at Berkeley, we do a lot of consulting, building uh, like proof of concepts for different Fortune 500 companies. So in the last few years, like, BMW, uh, Qualcomm, PayPal, a few others have come to us, and uh, yeah, pretty much, even though a lot of times, blockchain doesn't really integrate into like the business of a Fortune 500 company well, like they're not blockchain companies and they don't r necessarily always have a use for it, but a lot of times, uh, these companies are just wanting to build something related to the blockchain just because it's so popular at the time. Thank you, JJ. Um, so this is also pretty hilarious. I think the series of slides, Jamie Dimon, if you know who that is, he's the CEO of JP Morgan. He has had some pretty hot takes. And so we're gonna take you through some quotes, direct quotes from Jamie Dimon. Um, in January 2014, Jamie Dimon says, it's a terrible store of value. It can be replicated over and over, uh, which actually doesn't make sense. Um, and then in October 2014, he says, Bitcoin developers are going to try and eat our lunch, and that's fine. That's called competition, and we'll be competing. 
at November 2015, virtual currency, where it's called a Bitcoin versus US dollar, that's going to be stopped. No government will ever support a virtual currency that goes around borders and doesn't have the same controls. It's not going to happen. And then if you can read, um, you can track his statements over time. Bitcoin will not survive. 2015, 2016, Bitcoin is going nowhere. 2017, Bitcoin is a fraud. Later in 2017, I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin anymore. 2018, I regret making that comment. Um, he says, at an act, this is actually like in an international finance convention, he says Bitcoin is a fraud that won't end well. If you're stupid enough to buy Bitcoin, you'll pay the price for it one day. The blockchain is a technology, which is a good technology. We actually use it. God bless the blockchain. So his stance towards Bitcoin hasn't changed, but he sort of starts to see the merit uh, in blockchain technology. Uh, he says, I'd fire a JPM trader in a second who traded that. It's against the rules. It's stupid. It's dangerous in 2017. And I'm pretty sure he more recently came out with a statement where like two to three percent of their portfolios like has to be traded or something in cryptocurrencies. So, yeah. Um, and then they unveil Quorum um, in 2019 where JP Morgan claimed it's the first US bank to create and, su and successfully test a digital coin representing a fiat currency, which is a JPM coin. They, I think, sold Quorum to consensus in 2020, I want to say, but they developed Quorum um, as an internal ledger for banks. It's a fungible digital token that represents USD held by JPM. So this is them kind of like just dipping their toes in blockchain technology uh, and trying to sort of get on that wave, um, which a lot of banks are trying to do right now. They've since, I think recently, they're trying to develop um, an international payments network along with another blockchain network. Goldman Sachs is coming out with their own proprietary technology as well. They both, I think, helped with the Coinbase IPO. So they're really trying to get ahead of it before it gets ahead of them. Oh, yeah, okay. Any questions? Yes. So that's a good question. So a fungible token means that it can be, um, every token is the same. So in the first lecture, when we went over like what does it mean to be a currency, one of the characteristics of a currency is that it's fungible, so no $1 bill has any value over another $1 bill, but a non-fungible token, so an NFT, for example, um, has its like its specific value, so NFTs are not tr like tradable with one another. So a non-fungible token can't be traded for another non-fungible token um, of the same value. They have different values. Yes. Yes. That's a, that's a really good question. So there's actually like coin mixing is something that you can do with cryptocurrency for that reason. If you, if you don't know like where your currency came from, um, you can put it into a coin mixer and it basically just like mixes it around a bunch of times and like gets rid of past transactions and like does like a ton of weird stuff with it and then sends it back to you. Um, so you can't really, really trace like specific illicit transactions to like your own currency if it did happen because there's just so many like mixing that goes around. Um, but that's a good question. Yes. Are there any, sorry? To put in a savings account? That's a really good question. So that's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's uh, something called uh, decentralized finance, which I'll be talking about later in the lecture today. But pretty much um, you can, there's they're decentralized protocols. So they're not banks, they're protocols, th they're managed by code, and they allow you to loan out money and earn interest on it, and you can borrow from them as well, so. So, um, the company that I worked for this past summer actually has a protocol called Anchor, um, where you can store, where you get a 20% APY, which is crazy. So, you just put money in, um, it's a lend borrow protocol, so you put money in where other people can borrow, and just by holding your money in there, you get 20% yearly return. It's called Terra. T E R R A. The protocol is called Anchor. Um, two more questions. Yes. I think it means the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes. Liquidity, liquidity pools are, are like, if you want to exchange, um, like if, like, I, I know, I think I know you're re like referring to where if you want to like, um, like decentralized exchanges use liquidity pools. And yeah, there are problems with that, um, which we can go into in a later lecture. If you want to touch more we'll on that. More about, we'll be talking a little later about liquidity pools and how like this whole idea of minor, like minor extractable value. So ways that miners can actually do things with their funds and exchange them and join different pools in a way to make money or an interest and make the most bang for their buck. So great question, we'll, we'll hang in there and we'll get there soon. Yeah, and I think the, the, the similar idea of like how they can go under still applies. So for example, in like a lend borrow platform, the problem occurs like if you, so you have to collateralize your loan when you wanna borrow. And so if you, if you like under collateralize your loan, then, you, then you'll get liquidated. Um, but because there's that like safe measure in place, if you're the one lending, you're usually in the clear. Um, you just, if you're the one borrowing, you kind of have to like monitor your loan constantly and be like, okay, because cur currencies are so volatile, um, you might one day you might have like 100% over collateralized your loan, and the next day it's like 20% under. Um, so that's kind of like the issue with those types of pools. Um, you have a follow-up question, and then we'll and then we'll move on. What do they, what do they use for collateral? It depends. It depends on the on the protocol. Yeah. Cool, sorry, we'll try to do more questions at the end. Oh wait, this is me. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna get into blockchain community and politics and just, this is like a fun section about the community and how it interacts. Um, so we asked this question earlier, like how did you hear about blockchain? How do you get your news? Uh, there's a ton of different sources, Slack, Twitter is a huge one, Reddit, um, magic internet money, um, this tweet, proof of work provides nothing remotely like very good protection in the case of high network latency. Wait, so why do you think Bitcoin has a two week difficulty adjustment period? It's supposed to be, oh, I thought this would be a funny tweet. Um, so that's just like explaining like how you can go on Twitter for a lot of your questions and someone has probably already asked your question or someone will, a will answer your question. Blockchain at Berkeley is an example of a community of people who have similar questions to you who can answer your questions. Um, we have our Twitter website example. Um, in the blockchain community, we have different ways to come to consensus about changes that happen. We have the most trouble agreeing on block size, confirmation time, centralization in third party companies. So these are some topics that like there isn't even consensus in within the blockchain community. So even though you might think the blockchain community is so small, like they agree on all of these things that go into a blockchain, there are still so many more things that are left to consider and that are still being discussed all the time in a lot of those forums. And then there's also protocol politics. So for example, like once a protocol has been launched, there's still governance that has to, that has to go on. And so there's still things that have to be voted on um, and issues that have to be taken care of. And so Blockchain at Berkeley is super lucky to be involved in a lot of the governance. Um, so for example, this is an example of compound finance. So we are involved with compounds governance. And so we get to vote on proposals along with a ton of other college blockchain clubs, I think blockchain at MIT, blockchain at Penn, blockchain at Harvard, we're all involved in compound. Um, JJ, I think you, are you on governance team? Oh, okay. So <laughs> if you have questions, approach, um, Sin <laughs> approach <laughs> Sunil, <laughs> none of us. But so we're not directly involved in the governance, but it's very cool. And so if you're interested in governance at all, um, we, can, we can forward you to someone who can talk to you more about what the, what the actual process looks like in governance. Questions about that? Sorry? We might not have that on this deck. It might be in a past deck. Yeah, it might, might have been in a past deck. If you have any questions about it, we can try to answer it. But, yeah. All right, awesome. It wasn't this, right? Pretty much the, the idea of like platform politics is you want to create a balance between, what is it, I believe it was a mix of like private and public, publicized like platforms and organizations that interact um, 
and that kind of gets into like you lose some security and lose some independence from these privatized companies that manage your money or manage everything going on. And so it's the idea of who, like what is, like it's kind of more like the morals between behind blockchain, like should it be public or private? Yeah, the, the governance of platforms like uh, Compound and Aave is very interesting because when you give in, when you make and give loans on the platform, you get paid out their native token, Aave and Compound. And as you accumulate more tokens, you get a vote on things. So it's, that's the mechanism of, um, I guess, giving out the voting shares, at least for those uh, DeFi protocols. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, where we are now with blockchain and some of the exciting things currently happening. So in terms of energy, people have one really popular use case for blockchain that people have been talking a lot about is microgrids. So microgrids can be set up um, with rooftop solar panels with a blockchain ledger that keeps track of how much power people are using and who's paying for it. Um, it makes a distributed energy system able to function independently of a central utility and you can do net metering so residents can sell energy back and forth and blockchain is a very um, convenient solution for that. It's, it's not in practice but people have been building proof of concepts. Also, uh, Switch is a protocol which awards tokens to people and organizations that reduce their carbon footprint. For example, generating renewable energy or lowering energy usage. Another popular use case is with carbon credits. Um, people want to represent uh, carbon credits on the blockchain and then keep track of that there. It's easily tradable to allow for increased integrity of information and it's easier to measure the impact and see how much people are spending and you don't need a central entity to um, manage it. Veridum uh, tokenizes his carbon credits and has been used in a few carbon projects. Recycle2 coin rewards recyclers with cryptocurrency. Uh, before we move on from the environmental side, one other thing I wanted to mention is um, as much as like blockchain can be used to help the environment as you see in these use cases, um, one of the biggest criticisms of it is its impact on the environment from mining because realistically mining is um, a ton of redundant computation happening across the world and it requires an absurd amount of power and it's a, at a time like this when people are really concerned about solar energy, it's definitely a concern with blockchain. If anyone's really interested in the environmental impacts, um, come talk to me later because my two things I'm really interested in are blockchain and solar energy research. So for me, it's very much like a conflict of interest and I could talk about it for hours. So um, here are a few um, exchanges. There's centralized exchanges like FTX and OKCoin and then there's decentralized exchanges like Uniswap and decentralized exchanges. Um, I don't know if any of you guys heard of coins like SafeMoon last year. Um, yeah, SafeMoon, so like when people are creating these so-called um, uh, shit coins, excuse, <laughs> excuse, the t excuse the term, but shit coins, um, they have to, um, they, they frequently aren't able to get them listed on centralized exchanges because uh, the centralized exchanges don't want to list that. So they use uh, DEXs because you can just go ahead and list anything if you provide the liquidity yourself. Um, wait, sorry. Was anyone at the football game on Saturday? Did you see FTX, yeah. official sponsor? Okay, and then there's the whole world of DeFi, which in my opinion is the most exciting part of cryptocurrency. There's tons of protocols built on top of Ethereum. You guys can read up the board, there's so many, but the ones I've been talking about all day that I'm a little bit obsessed with are Aave and Compound, because you can earn 10%, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but like if you put your money in the bank, you'll earn less than 1% interest a year. But if you put it in something like Aave and Compound and you put it in a stable coin like DAI or USDC, you can earn 10% APY compounded every 13 seconds plus get paid out governance tokens. So it's, it's like a really insane opportunity for money that's just sitting in the bank. And on the borrowing side, the, some may ask like what the advantage for a borrower on this platform is because you do need to collateralize. Say you wanna borrow $100 worth of Bitcoin, you need to put up $150 worth of Ethereum. It's just an example, that's not the exact number. The exact number is determined by the governance protocols, but if that Ethereum drops in price below what the Bitcoin you borrowed is, so it's no longer collateralized, uh, the platform will liquidate you and you'll end up getting screwed on the buy side. 
but the reason people do it is so they can stay invest say um in the long i have a long-term position in ethereum and i want to keep that long-term position but i also want to leverage that money to make other trades i can I can put up the Ethereum as collateral, still hold it, and then take out the Bitcoin and make other trades. So you can leverage your money a lot more with that's that's the incentive on the buy side and on the uh, lending side. Obviously, you're in that incredibly high interest rate, and there's not a lot of risk on the lending side either because they'll they'll um, liquidate the buy side if if the price collapses, they'll liquidate the buy side. So there's not a whole lot of risk on the sell side. Sweet and. Uh, <laughs> Does the loaner take any risk? Yeah, well, the risk of... Well, the loaner does not take much risk at all. I mean, it's, it's, this is their year, so I'm not someone to give financial advice. I wouldn't make that their own opinion. But, <laughs> but Aave and Compound do, like, front almost all of the risk, and they do put, like, almost all of the risk on the buy side. So it's incredibly safe. It's incredibly yeah. safe from the sell side. Also, yeah, if anyone is interested in learning more about DeFi and has a little bit of programming experience, feel free, there's a CS294 is a decentralized finance class. Um, I'm putting in a shameless plug for my other class. Um, what was that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, and I just want to say that's taught by um, a professor, Don Song, who is like the, I would say the main blockchain professor at Berkeley currently. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, there's l or one. Yeah, talk to me. Come talk to me after. I'm a I'm a TA for uh, I'm a UGS sophomore. Oh, you can take it. You can. We'll talk if you're interested. We can talk after about it. Yeah. All right. So, um, a little bit about DeFi. So, a lot of really exciting things going on in the world of DeFi. Um, for starters, we see things like Compound and Aave, which JD talked about a little bit. But we can think of about pretty much Compound is just like a protocol that helps you with interest and can really make you a lot of money. And if you just manipulate things correctly, you can make a lot. And we see with um, Aave as well, too. It's like a high yield savings account. So, of course, ways to manage your money. And then ideas of yield farming. Um, and you know, like we'll talk about this a little later, but there are ways to like buy, sell, and just earn interest off of whatever you, whatever you put in. Open. What? Open was started by Scott. So was it? Oh. Yeah. Open. So Open's an options protocol that was started by Blockchain at Berkeley alumni. Um, Alexis Gaba, and there were a couple others that they met at Blockchain at Berkeley and then went on to start. Okay. Well, another uh, Berkeley startup. Sweet. Um, and just a few quick, quick things. So we have Substrate. Um, these are just a few kind of newer developments within, or like relatively newer developments within DeFi. Um, we have Substrate, which is pretty much just a way, very similar to if you, like, you have a web app and you build a framework for building out like web applications, Substrate allows you to quickly deploy blockchains and do so really efficiently. And so, pretty, yeah, it gives you a, like a foundation for doing so efficiently and effectively. And then we also have Polkadot, um, which you can just think of as like of a way to transfer information, data, currency, whatever it may be, across blockchains. And it does this really, like really seamlessly, which was a problem a lot of the which was a problem a while ago too, was figuring out how to make these transitions and connect these blockchains. And then we have the whole idea of Web 3.0. And so, for starters. This is kind of just demonstrates the kind of progression of the internet over time. So we start off with Web 1.0, which was back in like 96 all the way to 2001, 2002, which is pretty much where like the idea that you could access information online, but that was pretty much the extent of what you could do over time. And so in Web 1.0, like you could maybe access articles on Wikipedia, you could read someone's blog, but mostly the information was there for you to be able to pull from, but that was the extent. And as we see in the early 2000s, we saw the rise of Web 2.0 which is being able to publish. And this is where we saw kind of more the rise of social media and more interactions with users of the internet. So it's not like the internet and the users are separate, but it really connects everyone in a new way. And then finally, what we're seeing now in the past few years is, like thanks to blockchain, is the rise of Web 3.0, which is the decentralized web. So it's not necessarily relying on Facebook to be like the one control of your information, like the ones in charge of your information and social media, but instead you can do this all in a distributed manner. And so just to kind of a different way to illustrate all this is right here. So we see like the idea where a lot of these, I mean, I'm sure you probably recognize a lot of these like logos that are on the top half of the screen. 
but we see these transition into these alternate options of ways to do this all on the decentralized web. And so not needing one central party to be the ones managing and regulating all of this, but instead being able to trust underlying code and infrastructure to work with this functionality and provide the same output. And I think, yeah, that was it. Um, does anyone have any questions about that section? All right. Um, well, if not, we can stick around. Um, I just want to quickly give you the attendance code for this week. It is DAI, capital D A I. Um, and I'll leave this up. But other than that, thank you so much. That is our lecture for today. So thanks for sticking with us through the technical difficulties. Go Bears. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you have any, yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask now. You can also come up after class. If you're not on the B courses, please come up to us after class. Yeah. Make sure you're on the B courses. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, team. Thank you.